Okay, great. Hi, I'm Lori Asley with Gardens Buffalo Niagara, and we're here for another pro interview as part of our um, Buffalo Garden Views um, programming for this summer. Um, I'm on the board of Gardens Buffalo Niagara, which is the organization that brings you Garden Walk Buffalo, Open Gardens, which is now in its 10th year, the East Side Garden Walk, the Garden Art Sale, and two beautification grant programs. Um, and we're today, we're really happy um, to welcome Lynn Kamara. Um, Lynn is a retired kindergarten teacher. After retiring, she followed her lifelong love of nature and gardening, earned Master Gardener certification from Cornell, and began a gardening consulting business, Lessons from Nature. Lessons from Nature provides on-site gardening consulting, site assessment, and gardening classes, and sells organically grown perennials and native plants. She makes house calls to help solve your garden problems. Lynn is also an active volunteer for Master Gardeners, teaching and manning the hotline phones. She has a self-published book, Five Keys to Better Gardening, writes a monthly gardening column for After 50 Magazine, contributes garden tips to Upstate Gardener's Journal, and articles for the Master Gardener Newsletter and Figure 8, the Federated Garden Club's publication. Welcome, Lynn. You sound very Thank you. Me. Thank you for having me. Um, so here we are um, in this uh, presentation called Support Nature with Native Plants. And maybe we could move to our first slide. Thank you. So why are native plants becoming more popular? Well, people are realizing that um, nature needs our help, that we need to incorporate native plants into our landscape in order to help support the birds and the bees and the pollinators and all of those things and the insects. Uh, this picture uh, that is on the screen, uh, the tall plant that's shown is a native called tall meadow rue, and uh, the botanical name is there as well. And uh, it's one of my favorites. It's a, a found very common in our local uh, edge of the woods or near creeks. And it's just one of the examples of how beautiful native plants can be to add to your landscape. That's another thing reason they're becoming more popular is because people are realizing they're easier to care for because they were meant to live here. They evolved here. So they're used to our crazy weather and uh, all kinds of conditions. And um, one of my favorite books is by Doug Talame. He's written three books, actually. The first one I read was Bringing Nature Home. His newest one is... Um, we have that one right here. My my, escapes me at this point. <laughs> Sorry, but anyways, oh, you got a picture of it. Good. Anyways, yeah. he talks. He talks about the fact that our uh, suburbia and our cities are the are the new nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes on for miles and miles and miles. We can't have a national park in the middle of suburbia. So, what can we do to support nature? And planting natives is the way to go. You can, if everybody would plant two or three native plants, it would make a difference. It would create a bridge between properties so that uh, insects and pollinators and birds and other creatures could uh, find food and shelter. Right. So next that, slide. That new book is, is Nature's Best Hope. And, and I just want to make a plug for that because you brought Doug Tallamy to talk in Western New York just in May, which yeah, was a fantastic it, event. He, uh, he totally uh, changed my gardening perspective. I heard him speak at a conference in Virginia maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, and it just altered my perspective. And it was just amazing. And um, his concept, I think, is one that is workable. It's, it's not something that the average person can't do easily. Mm -hmm. So um, that's good. Next slide, please. All right, you're wondering why I'm showing this picture of absolute <laughs> lawn <laughs> and bushes. It's because um, native animals, insects, birds, pollinators, all of those things, they need the same things we need to survive. They need the ability to find food and shelter and the place to reproduce and rear their young. 
in a um, landscape like this, it's absolutely sterile. Grass doesn't feed anything but sod worms and <laughs> Japanese beetle larva and things like that. And the shrubs there are um, not native shrubs, so they're not feeding anything. Um, mm -hmm. Most of our landscape has little support for nature, and that's what's caused part of the problems. With, na with natives, you're offering what insects and animals need in order to live. You're offering them food, you're offering them shelter, and you're offering them habitat and places to rear their young. So uh, the main uh, easiest way for people to think about this is if you just got rid of a little bit of lawn and planted some native plants, right. that would make a huge difference. The less lawn, the better. It's high maintenance. Uh, most people use a lot of chemicals on it, which is not good. We're going to talk about that later, but um, the less lawn, the better. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is a monarch butterfly on uh, what is called uh, milkweed. It's, it's a butterfly weed. Unfortunately, a lot of the wonderful native plants have the word weed in their name, which is not helpful at all for people who want to uh, try to utilize native plants. They think, oh boy. Um, in fact, during open gardens, Someone just yesterday was in my garden and they planted to something goes, oh my God, I pulled that out as a weed. What is it? And I said, it's a beautiful aster. You're losing some real beauty from your garden by pulling that out. Mm -hmm. But we all know the story of the monarch, that monarch butterflies need uh, different uh, Asclepias plants in order to survive. Well, actually the butterflies don't. Butterflies can get their nectar from a variety of flowers. It's the larva of the butterfly, the monarch, that needs the milkweed plants in order to survive. It is the only plant that the larva can eat and live on. And the interesting thing is that's not the only butterfly in that situation. A strong majority of insects, including butterflies and other insects, have to lay their eggs on specific plants. So it's not like they can go around and lay their eggs and have the eggs develop into larvae and then develop into butterflies or moths or whatever else in any old plant. A strong majority of them need uh, plants and they need native plants. The reason they need native plants is because all of these things evolved together and they're dependent on each other. So their actual, for example, going back to the monarchs, on milkweed, um, their, their larva ha is only able to digest the enzymes and the nutrients in that particular plant because they evolve together. The fritillary butterfly needs violas, which is a native little violet that a lot of people spend a lot of energy weeding out of their garden and their lawn. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful little plant. All of it's edible for people too. Um, Painted lady, which is a very common butterfly that needs everlasting plants. Uh, Viceroy needs willows. Willow is a huge supplier of uh, food and shelter for a variety of uh, insects. And the spice bush swallowtail needs sassafras or spice bush. So mm -hmm. it could go on and on and on. The concept is if you want to attract nature, you need to su supply the plants that they need in order to live. And it's as simple as that. And if you um, read any of Talamay's books, you get the idea behind that very, very easily. Um, I guess we can go to the next slide. Okay, I love this picture of the birds on the branch feeding. Um, you know how we can't feed our children like a McDonald's, they simply couldn't digest it. Well, birds, mother birds have to stuff the food down the baby's throats. And they can't do that with hard insects. They can't, unfortunately, feed a Japanese beetle to their babies. Uh, they have to have soft-bodied insects in order to feed their babies. And where, what are those? Caterpillars. People see butterflies and they go, oh, wow, that's beautiful. They see a caterpillar and they go, oh my god, squash it, or what do I spray on it? Um, 
they don't realize the importance of caterpillars and larva in general in the food chain, especially for birds. And um, that's not the only uh, thing. Birds feed, they have to feed soft-bodied insects and they need a lot of them. So if you remember that first uh, yard that I showed you, there would be nothing there for a bird to feed its young, absolutely nothing. And think of when you drive through suburbia, there's a lot of nothing. There's a lot of, uh, I don't want to call them invasive plants, but non-native plants, because the native plants seem to have the thought behind them that people expect them to look like weeds or to look unattractive or messy or whatever. And that's not mm -hmm. the case at all. They're absolutely beautiful plants. Um, so many of the non-natives are popular because they're marketed as pest free. The reason they're pest free is that nothing here can eat them, except Japanese maple are fond of other plants that come from Japan, like uh, the, I'm sorry, Japanese beetles like Japanese maples and other plants from Japan, as well as many things from our garden. Unfortunately, they eat a lot of stuff. Um, and of course, are, you, pardon me? Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to just say that the, the interest in bird watching has increased dramatically since we've all been at home for so long for the yes. past few months. And if you really want birds to see in your yard and at your feeders, if you have native plants, you'll have far more birds, which is actually quite a lot of fun. Oh, it is. It's wonderful. And there are certain plants that you can grow um, to attract certain birds. People are familiar with hummingbird plants, but there are lots of birds uh, that like the plants, the native plants that have berries especially in the fall. Buried native plants are very important in the fall. Uh, the birds need energy for their migrations. Mm -hmm. And the ber berries that stay on native plants in the woods and they uh, stay all winter, they're, they're life-saving for birds that spend the winter here. And I'm glad you mentioned bird feeders because people think, oh, I'm feeding, I'm feeding the birds because I have bird feeders up. Well, birds cannot feed bird seed to their baby. So you're feeding the adult birds. Uh, right. Doug Tallamy has a, a very sad slide that he shows in one of his presentations of uh, an empty bird nest that the babies have died and there's all kinds of bird seed, sunflower seeds in there, that the mother was so desperate to feed those babies that she tried seed and they can't eat it. They can't digest it. So right. if you want birds, you have to do more than bird seed. You have to plant right. some native plants. And birds really do need our help right now. You know, the oh, Cornell God. Lab of Ornithology is reporting about the astonishing um, loss, uh, a depletion of the numbers of birds. And we're in a very, we are literally in an important bird area and uh, on a mag migratory pathway. So yeah. our area is especially important to support our, our, our feathered friends. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that the I don't know why, but it seems like the butterflies get a lot more press than the birds. And the right. birds are in um, severe danger. They're, they're diminishing, their numbers are diminishing in frightening, in frightening numbers. Uh, the statistics are awful. And part right. of it is because of habitat destruction. They don't have a place to live and eat and raise their young because right. of all our sterile environments. And right. uh, we can change that. So I want to be positive because we can definitely. Yeah. Well, we've made a whole lot of progress with the butterflies. Like yeah. So many people want to have, have uh, milkweed now, and that was not the case 10 years ago. Oh, so absolutely not. Progress absolutely. is good. Yeah. <laughs> well, if we can spread the word about birds, uh, that would be good too, because we need a lot more than butterflies. <laughs> That's for sure. That's absolutely. for sure. Okay, absolutely. could we go to the next slide, please? There we go. Um, this is a mix of natives uh, from my garden. The red one uh, is, um, uh, well, I'll start in the back. The, green, the ones with the green pointy things behind the red flowers is a swamp milkweed. We're gonna be talking about that later, but it mm -hmm. has the, uh, the milkweed pods, but they're thin like fingers and they point up. And it's, it's really cute. They're, they're very, very good. And, um, 
The red one in front is a cardinal flower. It's a Lobelia native. Uh, it's best known for drawing um, hummingbirds, but it also draws pollinators. The one below that is black-eyed Susan, which is very common. People don't realize that that's a native plant, um, the this, this species. Um, okay, so how do you start finding a native plant to grow in your yard? That's always everybody's question. And it's basically no different at all than planting a regular plant, except people tend to go to nurseries and shop backwards. They go to a nursery and they see a plant and they go, oh, that's so pretty. I want that you know, next to my door or my window or so I can see it. And they have no idea really what environment that plant needs to grow. So how much sun it gets there, the, I think my favorite thing about natives is that no matter what your environment, you can live on clay soil, you can have total shade, you can have total sun, you can have all kinds of environments. There will be a native plant that will grow there guaranteed. Much, much better than something that you get at a regular nursery. Um, so figure out, keep track of how much sun. I have found uh, in my consulting business and helping people that they really don't have a concept of how much sun certain parts of their yard get. And that's very important. The other thing that you have to uh, look into is your soil, the pH, if you've never had your soil pH tested. Um, just like any plant, some native plants will only survive in certain pH soils. Um, so you want to have the soil. You can do it yourself. You can get kits at any nursery or you can uh, send a soil sample uh, to the cooperative extension when we open it up again after this horrible bout we're in right now. Um, so the soil, the sun, even the amount of wind is important for what plants will grow there and the amount of moisture in the soil. Some people say, oh, my ground is so dry, I'll never be able to grow anything. Not true. There's lots of native plants that will take and prefer dry soil. The same with the opposite. Oh, I have practically a swamp in the spring in the back of my yard. Nothing will grow there. Not true. There's a look at swamps in nature. They're filled with plants. It's a wonderful environment. So no matter what your environment, um, you can find native plants, but you have to do a little bit of homework. You have to study your environment and then look through a good book like uh, Don Leopold's book, uh, Native Plants of the Northeast. There we go. That's the resources. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's, um, where is it? The fourth one down, Native Plants of the Northeast by Don Leopold. That's like practically my Bible. It's, my copy is almost falling apart. Yeah. Um, it's the only book that shows plants uh, only of the Northeast. There are a lot of books on native plants, but you might look at something, oh, that's beautiful, and find out it grows in the Rocky Mountains or something. So right. this book is just about uh, the Northeast, and it's the only book that covers grasses, ferns, flowers, vines, shrubs, and trees all in one book. Yeah, and, and he has this, that opening chapter where he talks about plant communities and how the plants interact and how they need to interact and that fosters their growth. It's a fantastic book. I'm glad you, you mentioned that one. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful book. Um, I had the wonderful experience of going to the first annual native plant uh, conference that, that Don Leopold uh, put together in Syracuse. Um, because he teaches at Syracuse University, but there was never any second annual because it was so difficult for him. So, so time consuming to organize it, he never did. But actually, uh, we spent a half a day just tromping through the woods and looking at plants and oh, it was just wonderful. He's very knowledgeable. And his book is easy to read and it mm -hmm. covers the actual native range of each plant and their growing requirements and their um, propagation requirements if you're into right. propagating your own plants. So it, uh, that would be a, a must. And um, then the Western, or excuse me, Buffalo Niagara water keepers that used to be river keepers, yeah. now they're water keepers. They have a wonderful book, The Guide to Native Plants for Your Garden, specific to Western New York. And um, I believe it, it was available free online I don't know if it still, still is. It still, it still is. is. So you just, um, Laura, you just go to the Waterkeepers 
website? Yes. And, and if you okay. buy it, you can order a copy. It's not that much money and it does go, you know, it yeah. does go towards supporting Waterkeeper. Very good is, cause. And really another good. thing about that book that is good, not only does it talk about the specific plants for our region, but in the back, um, it gives some guides to like plant communities, as you mentioned, Lori, right. uh, little like sample garden designs, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, plants that would go well together. And that's very important. Uh, then we already spoke about Bringing Nature Home by Doug Talamay. Uh, that book gives you more of an insight into the relationship between um, birds, insects, and plants. Mm -hmm. it, it really brings it right home and makes you realize how important it is. And then Nature's Best Hope is his latest book. And that's where he discusses what we, can, we as homeowners can actually do to support nature. His concept is called, um, I'm trying to remember, I think it's Neighborhood National Parks. Homegrown National Parks. Homegrown National I'm, Parks. I'm very yeah. taken with this idea myself. Oh, it's a great <laughs> idea because you j just take Western New York. We can't plop a big gigantic national park right here. And so if we all plant some things, it makes a park out of our whole region. Birds can go from tree to tree and get their uh, insects or their food or make their nests. It's, it's a wonderful, easy to read book. Um, yeah. I'm gonna go back to bringing nature home because the, uh, the back of that book, the appendix has a marvelous section where it shows if you want to, what native plants will attract certain butterflies, certain moths, yeah. support certain birds and um, the Leopold book also has an outrageous index in the back where he lists plants for dry sun, wet sun, dry shade, moist shade, you know, yes. all kinds of different areas. So mm -hmm. you can look through it and choose plants that would fit into your habitat. Yeah, and the Talamy, but for those interested, the two Talamy books and the Donald Leopold book, they also have all of their research in it. So, you know, like, how, what is the impact of having a water source? What is the impact of, of, um, of cultivated varieties? And what insects can, you know, what, what are actually beneficial for insects? Those yeah. kinds of things. So really great research is, is referenced as well. Right. That's the best thing about all those books is they're not just, oh, this is a nice plant. There's research behind why. Um, and then The Living Landscape is a newish book by Doug Talamay and Rick Dark. And they have um, come together to, I think it would be to organize information on how you can start this and looking at your yard and figuring, okay, this, this area is uh, understory, under trees, or this is the ground level. And they talk about native plants at each level in your garden because you need things on the ground level, you need things in the middle level, you need above level trees. And um, the pictures are, I mean, it's worth, if you don't read a word of it, it's worth it just to look through the pictures. It's a gorgeous book. Um, and then uh, one non-book, uh, but it's a wonderful resource for anything native or nature or insect or anything is the M Missouri Botanical Gardens website. I want to mention a lot of people go online to find information, but if you're doing any information about plants, insects, birds, whatever, you don't want to go to a source that's trying to sell you something. So you want to go to a source that's either um, an EDU university like uh, Cornell, Penn State, that are research base information or botanical gardens. Both of those types of sites are the areas where you want to go. I mentioned Missouri Botanical Gardens because I, found their, I find their site so easy to use. Um, the Cornell website is excellent information, but I find it somewhat more difficult to use. Um, I shouldn't say that being a Cornell Master Gardener, but it is true to me anyways, and most of my friends use the mature Missouri Botanical Garden site. So are there any other resources, Lori, that you're familiar with that you would suggest? Um, I do like the Lady Bird Johnson yes. site a awesome. lot. Awesome. Um, and I like the um, uh, National Wildlife Federation's Plant Finder. 
Um, and you can put your zip code in there um, so you can find very, very local, you know, it, like really down to your own zip code, um, yeah. what kind of native, what plants are actually native to your area. Right. And some of those are actually surprising. Yeah, and at X, very much so. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay. I know, Laura, you had some questions and specifically about how to start plants and where to start. Did we cover the things you wanted to start talk well, about? Well, I wanted to ask if the, if, uh, a couple of things. So um, is there anything in particular that you do to prepare a, a bed or, or a place to plant native plants? Is there anything special that is done? Thank you for asking that because that's pretty important. First of all, if you're using native plants, you want to use the native soil. Most of the native plants, you know, they grow in nature. Nobody uh, feeds them miracle grow once a week or anything. They have to survive on their own. So the reason they can do that is because the soil in nature is alive with microorganisms and decomposing plant material and all that stuff that we tend to remove from our gardens. You know, we rake it up and make it clean as a whistle. And that's about the worst thing for the soil. And mm -hmm. for uh, insects that lay their eggs in leaf litter on the ground, which is a considerable amount of insects, and the birds that go peck through the leaf litter to find their food. So mm -hmm. I think the less maintenance, the better. You don't want to clean everything up. To prepare the soil, if the soil is not naturally rich and loamy, um, Loamy means kind of airy with maybe some leaf mold and stuff in it. I do add a little bit of compost to a planting hole. Not more than one third of the amount of soil because you don't want to make the soil too rich. Most native plants don't prefer rich soil. So you don't have to feed them or any of that kind of stuff. If you have, uh, if you use compost, that's really important because you want to have those live microorganisms. That's what actually feeds plants, is the life in the soil. In healthy soil, there is billions with a B of microbes that live in a small amount of soil, like a tablespoon. And um, their decomposing of their bodies and their uh, microbial uh, poops, <laughs> for lack of a better word, are what feed the plants. And so you want to uh, add to that what I have evolved into using. I try to use nature as my guide. So what does nature use? Nature uses leaves. So when I was first gardening, I used a lot of compost. I actually used compost as mulch because my soil was awful. It was very heavy in clay. And now the only thing that I use is mulched leaves. I gather them in the fall. I use them as a uh, mulch uh, in the spring. And then I usually add to it end of the summer when that has decomposed. Uh, it's a wonderful, natural, free mulch that helps um, build the soil. So that's what I do to my soil. Um, do you use any fertilizers at all other than that? I do not. Um, some of my annuals and pots, I'll use fertilizer, but I don't ever fertilize any of the natives because over the years, my soil has become really very nice. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's just full of rich nutrients. I do, um, as I said, I add compost to every planting hole, but... Um, as I said at the beginning, I used to compost mulch, excuse me, mulch with compost, just to add, just to build up the soil, and that took a number of years. Mm -hmm. uh, this, those things don't happen quickly, and a lot of people ask about, and I mentioned about pH. Uh, it's always best. The best recommendation is to plant something that suits the soil that you have, rather than try to change the pH. Um, I had a bed of ferns under a Norway spruce, which is a very stupid thing to do because they're not happy there. Uh, it's too acidic. They don't get enough uh, sun and then the tree roots just drink up all the moisture and they didn't survive. And I was trying to feed them and I'm thinking, okay, I was trying to lime the soil and thinking, well, that will hurt the tree. The tree's more important than ferns. I can move the ferns to another place. Right. So now you just experiment with what will grow where. And uh, don't be afraid to move things if it's not happy after a couple of years. 
Right, right. That's an important thing. You know, people come around to our open gardens and think that we can just grow everything and, you know, somehow we have this magic ability. But really yeah. what it is, is we've killed a lot of things and we've moved a lot of things and we've learned over time what will grow where in our space. And that's just made all the difference. There's a joke amongst the master gardeners, as you can tell, a mass, how good a master gardener is by how many plants they've killed. You, know, you have to try. You have to try things and uh, push the envelope a little bit. Um, okay, do you want to, to go on to pictures of some of the natives? Sure. Okay, next slide, please, Lauren. Okay, this has two of the milkweed plants. Uh, swamp milkweed is on the left with the botanical name and butterfly weed is on the right. And I have swamp milkweed up there instead of the field milkweed because it's um, a much more compatible garden plant. First of all, the swamp milkweed is a little bit better. It's much better behaved. The field, field milkweed will spread. Um, if it starts overtaking your garden, it's somewhat difficult to get rid of. And also, actually, the monarchs prefer the swamp milkweed because the leaf isn't as thick for the larva. It's easier for the larva to digest. And the butterflies prefer it because as you can see on the plant, it's not a round flower like the field milkweed, it's a flat or humbled flower. So they can land on it more easily and get the, uh, the nectar. And uh, it's a beautiful plant. It's yeah. listed as wanting the name swamp in there, kind of tells you it prefers more soil. I have mine in a rather dry spot actually in my garden, but I do supplement water, especially during this heat that we've had. You have to almost anything. But right, uh, right. swamp milkweed is good. Butterfly weed is a little bit more difficult to grow. It has, um, it prefers very lean or non-fertile soil, even gravelly, rocky kind of soil. And um, full sun is very important for that. I have had no luck growing that because I think my soil is too rich to, to grow that. I've tried it a few times. If I try something two or three times, I, I give up. It's obviously, it's not gonna work here. And you'll notice the, um, the botanical names. That's extremely important in native plants because uh, so many plants have common names and common names are different in areas and all kinds of things. So, um, right. and we're gonna talk, um, in a few slides uh, a little bit more about why that's important. Mm -hmm. So next slide please. Virginia bluebells. Um, this is an early early spring flower. It comes up it even gets snowed on sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a spring ephemeral, ephemeral excuse me which means it dies back like a tulip or a daffodil and so you want to plant something around it that's going to fill up that empty space when it dies back in the spring. But that beautiful blue color is just gorgeous to have in the spring. Um, and it's a very important plant for early pollinators, the bees that come out uh, early in the season. There's not much up. And uh, it grows very easily. It does prefer shade. You can see the leaves on the ground. That's my garden. You can see stems in the background. When I cut back something, I drop the stems in the spot and let them decompose there because that's what happens in nature. Mm -hmm. The plants feed themselves. So um, you might think I have a messy garden. Maybe I do, but it's healthy uh, and, it, and it's good for the natives. Mm -hmm. um, the plants that I chose to show you are all, all also very readily available at local nurseries, uh, especially nurseries that specialize in natives, which we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide, please. This is sundrop. This very common uh, flower. It's the yellow flower on the right. It has a very long bloom and it just gets totally covered with honeybees and very small pollinators. Um, I've never taken the time to like capture a few of them and look them up and see what they are, but just you never realize how many insects there are that pollinate plants. Honeybees are a, a small majority, really, of pollinators. Uh, and it's fascinating. That's my favorite thing about growing natives. So so far is the, just the whole garden is a buzz with uh, life. And uh, these native plants also, in particular sundrops, they attract 
uh, what are called beneficial insects. And part of the beneficial and beneficial insects is that they eat some of the bad guys. So you'll have far fewer um, insect problems if you grow native plants. I have found that, I can't tell you how much, I hardly have any insect plant problems, except for a few Japanese beetles. <laughs> now and again. But anyways, uh, sun drops are a very nice plant. The, it gets uh, all season interest because in the fall, uh, the leaves turn kind of crimson. So it's very pretty. It's definitely one you don't want to cut back after the flowers fade. Um, and it, it, as I said, it lasts a long time and it's very bright. Practically needs sunglasses to look at it. So if you like yellow, it's a, a full to part sun plant. It will take some shade. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, coneflower, echinacea. This um, was one of the native plants that was perennial plant of the year one time, and it became so popular, people got kind of bored with the same old color, and so the nursery business started making cultivars or genetic um, mutations or genetic variations of this plant. You can now get, I don't even know how many kinds of coneflowers, I think it's more than 40. and um, you can get them in all sizes, all shapes, all kinds of colors. However, the farther you get away from the Echinacea pupera, which is the, the native natural strain of the coneflower, the less productive it is for nature. Some of the coneflowers that you can buy now may be beautiful, but they don't feed anything. They're actually sterile because they're tissue cultured, which means they can't, they don't even make seed. They can't grow from seed. Uh, they grow in test tubes from the little pieces of the tissue of the leaves. So they're exact clones of each other, which is not really a good thing for nature because if some disease comes along, all the clones are exactly genetically the same. That's what happened to the impatience a number of years ago with the, when the impatience downy mildew hit everybody's impatience got hit because they are all exactly the same plant. And um, so when you're looking for natives, this is the reason that the, um, the Latin name is so important because if you see Echinacea prepara uh, desert sunset or uh, ice cream social or one of the many, many varieties, that is not the native strain. You want just the native. Now there are exceptions to that. All the um, cultivars are not bad. Some of them that are maybe first generation cultivar are still able to feed nature. But you always want to look for the, um, the basic native pure strain if you can find it. And ask at the nurseries because natives are becoming so popular, people go and they buy things that are listed as native but then they have this little name after them, you know, that's not just the species name. Right. That's your clue that it's not the true species. And you have to ask the nursery request native plants, the native species, because people are buying things that are listed as native plants that really aren't necessarily helpful to natives. Right. Yeah, that's one thing about um, gardening with native plants is that you have to do a little bit of homework before planting. Absolutely. I learned that like probably many, many others did the hard way, you know, coming home with cultivars um, that don't really support growth, yeah, as I've sure. learned later. Yeah. The one cool thing about the echinacea, um, and, and th this goes to garden care, we're taught to deadhead right? As soon as the flower is gone, you, 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 you deadhead. But if you don't, in the city at least, where we have more finches, I think, in the city than outside, if you don't deadhead, you will have goldfinches coming for those seeds. And it is a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. I uh, thank you for saying that because that is a really important thing about maintaining native plants. You have to follow nature. Nobody cuts them back. Leave them up. The, the uh, dying leaf material forms an excellent protective barrier around the root system. It provides uh, habitat for all kinds of insects to lay their eggs and the larvae to pupate over the winter. And then that supplies food to birds and the seeds left up. I enjoy the, everything being left up because it 
kind of reminds you when you look at it in the snow, maybe there's some little snow on the caps of the seed heads. It's so cute. And it reminds you that, oh yeah, I have a garden there. You know, yeah. and um, it's like gardening all season. It's a very important yeah. part. Thank you. Yeah. In the spring, yeah. I do cut things back. You know, after the seeds have all dropped and uh, been all eaten by the birds, which will happen, then I cut back and I, you know, clean up the crowns and stuff in the spring. But in fall, the only thing I take care of in fall is to remove anything that's diseased or maybe had an insect infestation. One thing that if affects insect is the four-line plant bug or affects natives as well as other plants. The four-line plant bug is a small insect that sucks uh, the juices out of the plants and it just leaves little dots all over the leaves. So it looks like just little polka dots everywhere. And they lay their eggs in the stems of the plant mm -hmm. after they're finished. So the eggs are in the stems now because their season is finished now. So those stems after the plant is done, I do cut back because that will eliminate that, in, for the most part, eliminate that insect for the next time or right. if you've had a, a disease. Right, and those do. don't go in the compost. No, definitely not. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I put this in here on purpose. Um, it's a goldenrod. One reason is I wanted to let everybody know goldenrods do not make you sneeze. They're, they have pollen that is sticky. So pollinators have to go to the plant. Uh, whereas it's ragweed that makes you sneeze and that pollen goes in the air for like a mile. Um, and they grow in similar habitats. They bloom at the same time, but goldenrod is yellow and showy and ragweed is like green and nondescript. And so people just blame goldenrod and it's not the case. Uh, and I, there are many varieties of goldenrod that are native locally, including one, a blue stem goldenrod that grows in the shade quite well. It's lovely. Uh, you see it in our woods quite often. Um, but I put this one slide in here on purpose because it is a cultivar. See, Solidago rugosa fireworks. Mm -hmm. This is a cultivar. However, it's a first generation cultivar. It's actually recommended in Leopold's book and it's loaded with pollinators. And I love, it looks like fireworks. It's a very unusual plant, uh, very showy in your garden, very hardy. hardy. It also um, is not as invasive as field goldenrod. Mm -hmm. Field goldenrod is a, a wonderful plant as well. I have some in my yard, but I have to weed it out a lot because the seed goes everywhere. Right. So um, if you have a, a native plant that is seeding too much, then just cut the flower heads off before they drop seed, if that's an issue for you. If not, um, I sell plants in the spring, so I let everything seed and then that's what I sell the next year. So uh, again, messy garden, but it's uh, a fruitful one. But the fireworks mm -hmm. goldenrod is a showstopper. People, it's in the front of my uh, house and if I'm working out there, people walk by and they go, what is that yellow plant? And I say goldenrod, they go, why are you growing goldenrod, you know? But uh, look at that plant, that's a striking plant. Yeah, and, and, the, and the butterflies need nectar too, right? Oh, so yeah. they're getting ready for their big trip south. So the they- fall, Yeah, fall blooming plants are very, very important. Um, yeah. The asters and the goldenrods, all of those. Oh, and they're easy to grow. Think of the fields, no matter what the weather, we can have hot, cold, wet, dry, Come mm -hmm. October, the, the, the asters and the goldenrods are gorgeous. And that'll happen in your yard too. They're wonderful. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Speaking of asters, there are a number of kinds of asters. This is the New England aster. It's very similar to the New York State aster. They come in shades from blues to pinks to roses to purples. Uh, they can get quite tall, very, very tall. Um, I tend to cut mine back in June, mid-June. Uh, to about half height. That way they grow lower and uh, they, you get more blooms that way too. It, mm -hmm. It's sort of like deadheading, only you do it before any uh, blossoms are set. And it's hardy. Nothing bothers this plant, but boy, is it used by the pollinators. Just amazing. Just amazing. Um, and by the way, I have never been stung by anything in my yard. Never. They, they just don't bother you. You know, they're, they're on their business. They're, they're eating dinner. 
they're not going to bother <laughs> us with you. But um, the uh, asters in particular have a wide range. Most people think of the field asters, but there's a white wood aster and a blue wood aster that can grow and bloom nicely in a pretty dense, just dappled light shade. They're beautiful plants. And so many people complain about not having color at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. Native plants, it's the answer. There's all kinds of uh, things. The problem with buying the, uh, these plants in the spring is that they, nurseries tend to put out things that are in bloom when you buy them. And right. so it's hard to find this unless you go to nurseries that specialize in natives, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that the asters are amongst my favorite. Right? It's just, I don't know, just makes me feel good to see all those flowers at the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're super pretty. And it is unfortunate that people weed them out, right? So, and, but that's a oh, question yeah. I have for you too about weeds and, and, and weeding. Is there, what do you do about weeds? I always say that if you have a garden, you are going to weed. That's part, <laughs> that's part of gardening. Like to prevent weeds, um, you know, it's, it's, it's antithetical to it. You're, you're saying yeah, don't... You have that's You're right. Preparing ground to not grow. And right. that's exactly what we don't want. We yep. want everything to feel like somebody it. commented that they came to my yard once and they said, Oh, you have all perennials and perennials. It must be wonderful to have a carefree garden. And I thought that that joke to be deserves to be on Letterman or something. <laughs> so far from the truth. But um, if you mulch properly, it really cuts down on the weeds. And uh, when I see a weed, I try to get it right away. If, uh, the leaf mulch, the, the, and it's mulched leaves. You can't put the just whole leaves down because they tend to mat. So right. in the fall, I gather up mulched leaves uh, from other people's yards. You know, they put them out on the curb and I go around and gather them in my bags and store them under my hemlocks for the winter. Um, but anyways, the mulched leaves make a wonderful weed barrier because you put them on about you know two three inches thick where's my hand it doesn't show i don't know how to figure this out okay pretty thick except around the crowns of the plants and it's such a good mulch because it's thick it holds moisture in the soil so much better than the other mulch and mm -hmm. it's a excellent weed barrier and if anything right. does come through the weeds you can pull it out like butter so the secret to weeding is to get them fast However, the other secret to weeding for natives to me is until you learn what the plants look like, until you grow a plant, you might pluck out something that looks like a weed, but it's not, it's a native plant. So if something comes up in my yard that I don't know what it is, I leave it and I let it grow till I figure out what it is. And I've gotten some wonderful volunteers that way. Right. And uh, volunteers are the best thing in the world because you know that that's a habitat they can grow in. Sure, sure. And of course, the birds bring gifts. Oh, yeah. Right. So if you're welcoming birds into your garden, yeah. they are bringing you gifts along the way as yeah. well. I have a and wonderful stand of Mahonia, which isn't native to Western New York. It's native further west, but it looks like holly. People think it's holly. And um, they came from a na the neighbor next door. The birds would eat the berries, sit up in my trees, and drop them down. I have a whole bed of Mahonia from the birds. It's beautiful. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, it blooms <laughs> yellow in the spring and it has beautiful berries. Very nice plant. Um, but weeding is always an issue no matter what you grow. But don't be too quick. Another thing about the natives is if you have grow them in, in mass, there's not that much room for weeds. You know, there's not that much empty space. Um, like the kind of the cottage, cottage garden feeling, you know, everything's growing together and uh, that lessens the space. Have you done any experimenting with, uh, um, with under plantings or what people are now calling green mulch? Living mulch, did you say? Yeah. Um, yeah. I have not. I do have a lot. I suppose you would call ground covers living mulch. Yeah, I do have a lot of uh, wonderful native ground covers as well as some that aren't native, but um, yeah, that's a great way to cover the ground because if the ground is bare, something will grow there. No matter what you do, if there's a spot of ground, something's going to grow there. So the more you cover the ground, the better you're off you're going to be weed-wise. 
Okay, well, we should move to that last slide. Okay, um, where to get natives? The website at the top, I apologize for it being so long for you to copy, but is this gonna be available to people to, to check uh -huh. later on? Okay. Um, the PRISM, which is uh, the Invasive Species, Western New York Invasive Species uh, Group, they have this excellent uh, website and it's a native plant list supplier. So you can go to that website and they have many, many nurseries listed that sell native plants. The ones on the left are local to Western New York and um, Lockwoods I think has about the best selection of natives uh, they do sell cultivars as well. Um, Russell's, Johnson's, Mishler's, Urban Roots, those are many, those are some of the nurseries that carry native plants. As I mentioned before, the important thing is for everybody to go to their nursery and ask them to get native plants because if consumers ask for them, nurseries will carry them. And that's what's happening. Um, Amanda's garden is down in Dansville. She um, self propagates over a thousand varieties of local natives. And uh, she does do mail order. She's down in Dansville. It's, it's a great day trip to visit her nursery. She has an excellent website. Just, it's very informative. It's like a book. I mean, you could learn, mm -hmm. you just spend a day looking through her website. Um, and also to put in a, a plug, we, we work together uh, in the spring on the Saturday before Memorial Day weekend. We have a plant sale here at my home. She comes with her plants, I have my plants, and between us, we have more native plants in my driveway, uh, probably close to a thousand plants, than you will find anywhere in Western New York at one time. And some unusual ones that you would not be able to find at local nurseries. But as I said, she does do mail order. If you wanna take a great day trip, the Plantsman Nursery near Ithaca is fabulous. They're probably the, the largest one in this half of the state. And while you're there, you can go and visit the native plant uh, section at Cornell University at their plantations, which is yeah. wonderful. It's like a dream come true walking through there. Um, I don't know if you've ever, ever been there, Lori. Yeah, I have. I yeah. have. It's fantastic. And their arboretum is a oh, wonderful yeah. place to walk you, through. It, yeah. You can just spend a weekend there. It's fabulous. And, and then and, if you are there, you have to go to the, the, the or ornithology segment. Yes. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. So it's worth it to go for the weekend, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, were there any questions that you had, Lori, that we didn't get to? I think we've covered an awful lot. We've been talking for quite some time. I know, <laughs> I carried away, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really great. It was so good to talk to you and, and so yes, great thank to you. have you as part and of And thank you program. for creating the opportunity to spread the word about natives. It's so important for we're living on this planet and we are the caretakers and we need to do a better job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm totally in agreement. Well, thank you again. Thank you so, so much. Okay, and, thank uh, you. Wonderful talking to you. Take care.